Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Greemer. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Okay, that was, that was fresh. Nelson, how are you today? I'm doing well, yourself? Excellent, hydrated, caffeinated, happy, healthy, and excited to dig into Webflow pretty deeply today. Uh, I know for those of us uh, who were part of uh, the session we held a couple days ago, if you watched a recording and you're doing these back to back, the session from a couple moments ago, uh, we had a fantastic time together going through some of the principles uh, of the web and digging into a little bit in Webflow. So really excited to recap some of that and dig deeper today into some of the superpowers we have. But before we do that, uh, I'd love to just start with a tiny icebreaker that's completely and entirely unprepared, at least for Greemer and Nelson, which is to ask, what are you listening to lately on Spotify? or Apple Music, or I don't know what else is there. What do they do in Iceland, Creamer? Is it, um... We have our own uh, streaming service called Ice Ice Top Hits. It's very good. Wait, it's called Ice Ice Top Hits? Yes, Ice Ice Top Hits. Okay, and what, are you, what are you listening to on Ice Ice Top Hits? I mostly listen to global uh, pop, uh, like, you know, bangers, like really good songs, and they all go to Ice Ice Top Hits. So it's like <laughs> I knew we'd start this morning with you. I listened to uh, bangers, top hits. <laughs> uh, I'm very you. like now, you know, all the like the, the CDs like now. Like I'm very basic. You know, oh, this is like, you're talking about the CDs now. That's what now, I call yeah, music. Yeah. How do. many of those do they have now? I think at least like 300, 400. <laughs> I haven't checked lately. <laughs> How about you, Nelson? To Ice Ice. How about you, Nelson? What are you uh, listening to? I am listening to Porter Robinson and Maddian, really good EDM artists. I feel like I may not have actually, if with EDM for me, and this is always the way it is with radio or, uh, I'm, I'm really dating myself there, it's not radio, what is this called? Streaming music. Uh, I, I will hear something, I'll be like, oh, this is cool, but I will never know who it is, unless it's, of course, John Williams. Um, so it's like film music, it's like, okay. That's Williams. Everything else, I'm like, oh, that sounds interesting. So Nelson, Greemer, I would strongly suggest that we take a little bit of time, create a shared playlist where we're combining Iceland uh, Icelandic uh, curated uh, but global pop hits and bangers with uh, these two EDM artists I've already forgotten the name of. So I think that would be a great thing. And we can throw a little Williams in there, maybe a little Hedwig's theme. Uh, maybe a little Schindler's List, uh, maybe some Jurassic Park, Journey to the Island. These are classics. By the way, if anyone is doing web design, web development, or especially if you're in a copywriting session where you're putting together the, in, the information architecture for a site and you need some good, inspiring music in the background that's not going to be so distracting uh, that you're going to have to stop what you're doing, Journey to the Island from Jurassic Park is probably the best one. Uh, that is, of course, until we explore Greemer and Nelson's mo most recent submissions here. So, is that the one that goes? Wah, 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 wah. It actually goes exactly like that, and I'm I'm kind of weirded out that back in '93 you were you were you were participating in the vocals because it's very clearly exactly like that. Well done. Uh, hi to everyone in the chat. I see folks from Poland. I see folks from. It's going too fast. It's it's a motion blur. So to everyone in the motion blur of chat, uh, welcome. Uh, Greemer and Nelson are going to be taking a look at the chat and uh, bringing up some things throughout this session. So if you have questions, you have comments, you just want to share some enthusiasm, go ahead and do so in the chat. Uh, super excited to join everyone who's live and to everyone who's watching this recording. Uh, welcome to you as well. So like I said, we're going to be doing a little bit of a recap of what we did in terms of fundamentals. We're not going to spend too long there because our key today is getting into Webflow and going deep with a few things that are particularly exciting. We're going to get into Webflow interactions today. Uh, interactions in Webflow or just interactions on the web. It's the idea of these two things. There's a trigger, like a mouse click, or when you're scrolling your page, when you're moving your mouse, different triggers uh, that trigger certain events. And the output of that is animations. So we're going to cover this. This is all going to be native web stuff. Uh, later on, we can layer in some amazing uh, uh, other options. But for this, we're going to do some pretty exciting stuff uh, in Webflow. So I'm really excited to dig into that today. So without further delay, uh, let's go ahead and dig in. I'm going to start by sharing my screen. We'll do a quick recap and we'll jump right into Webflow. So sharing an entire screen this time. And we'll go to screen one and share. Here we go. All right. Does everyone see Google? All right. Looking good. So. 
Last session, we covered a few different things. I'm going to hide this, get this out of the way. Uh, we covered a few different things. We covered the box model, which is the idea that on the web, uh, everything's made up of boxes. These are boxes that stack on top of each other uh, or next to each other based on properties that we as mere mortals can set. So what we're going to do is, again, at any time on the web, we can right click and go down to inspect. And we're using Chrome. This works on any browser. If you uh, are in Safari, for instance, you'll have to turn that on. But you can always Google how to inspect in insert browser name here. And we learned that, of course, we can hover over at any time to see that indeed everything is boxes, even things that have rounded, uh, rounded edges. Even if you see something like this tiny Maguire head that's circular, we can hover over and actually see it is a rectangular boundary. It's a box as well. If I want to delete Maguire, we just select that element and we delete Maguire. So we covered that. We covered on apple.com uh, that you can just change things as well. Not only can you right click and inspect and see again that everything is made of these boxes, but we learned that you can change things. If we like the word buy, that's great. If we want to say, uh, let's see, I'm trying to find the content here. I'm going to right click, buy Mac mini. Do you think it's this? It looks like this. Hello. Yeah, we can change the content by just double clicking, finding that text that's that's informing this HTML that's informing what gets rendered on the page. The word hello, we're able to double click, and we're able to change things, which is book a one on one appointment with Greamer. And now Apple is offering something perhaps even more valuable than a Mac mini supercharged by M2 and M2 Pro. So we covered that as well. And one of the things we didn't really dig into, but uh, this is always an option is as we're kind of working through things. We showed this very quickly in the last session. As we're working through things and we want to test or debug performance or we want to debug how a site is built or we just want to have some fun. Remember, you can click and drag and actually move these things around. Does that make sense? No. And the hierarchy is, of course, out of order. So let's hit Command Z, put it back because it was better before. Okay. So that's what we covered. We covered HTML, which is the content on the page, and we covered CSS. And the final thing we covered with CSS, which was pretty, pretty interesting, is that when we're using things like classes, we can apply something across multiple elements. So if we right click and inspect on this page and we see there's this background image that's of course made out of a linear gradient right here. If we apply, for instance, and I think this is being applied to all of these list items, uh, you can see maybe it's not super obvious. Let's change one of these colors. Let's change one to white. We'll change this one to black just to create some extra contrast. So when we're making these visual changes, we can see them applying to multiple elements at once. So the, the idea here, maybe this would be a better example down here. If we right click, the idea is that because we're using similar styles or we're using similar classes, uh, we can apply changes that don't just affect element by element, but multiple elements at once. So for instance, if we change the font size to 30 pixels, we're affecting multiple elements. It's not just affecting the current selected element. The reason we use CSS, the reason we apply these CSS properties to multiple elements is so you don't have to do it one by one. You can keep things even and matched and consistent. So we talked through that. Then we went into Webflow, and this is where we're going to pick up today. We built a mediocre-looking site that was rated by Greamer after the fact, 1.5 out of 5 in terms of design quality. I think that's generous. So today, we're not going to do much better in terms of design polish, but what we are going to do is go through the depths of some of the things that you can build, that you can develop in Webflow using these principles of HTML and CSS, but by layering on some really wild JavaScript. And the way we're going to do that is with Webflow interactions. So let's start there. We'll start with this basic site name, site name McGuire's type, top notch, notch site. Grimer, do you have a better name for this? I'm still thinking about the, the playlist, eye size, uh, top hits, but maybe that's not too good. Nelson, do you got something or? Oh, sorry. I uh, honestly, wanted to move very quickly there. Oh, yeah. And, I like uh, it. Uh, oh, we lost. <laughs> I wasn't logged in. Uh, I'm just going to use McGuire's Fantabulous site. Unless, Nelson, you got something quick? No, it would take too many uh, characters. So let's move on. Here we go. Okay, we are in Webflow. And like we covered, uh, Nelson, honestly, that, that site name is probably one of the best. Creamer, got to work on it. I'll work on it. Yeah, that was so good, Nelson. Yeah, Nelson, A plus. 
uh, I will say, uh, when we when we recapped, uh, or excuse me, recapping what we talked about a couple days ago is when we hit the add panel in Webflow, this is where all our HTML elements are. This is all of our content that we can add to the page. We have the basic things like headings, we have paragraphs, text links, you know, images, that type of thing. But we also have a lot of other stuff, structural things like sections, div blocks. And again, a div is just a rectangle that can wrap other rectangles together and it'll do whatever you want. We're gonna get into divs today. Uh, we covered that. So we covered, of course, adding something like a heading. And so if we say, hello, what did you say, Greener? Was it Frank? Hello, Frank. Yeah, Frank, I left Frank at home today, but he, I'll, 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 I'll tell him that we say hello. Okay, that works for me. Yeah. So hello, Frank. We covered that you can start styling things with classes. So on any element, we'll use a heading right now, but on any element, you can create a class. We'll call this one example class one and when we do that when we create a class we can not only style things to look how we uh, to make them look how we want so if we want to change the font to georgia change the font size to something obscene change the line height let's actually go a little advanced here and use a unitless line height so we use one and we use the little hyphen hit return and now it's unitless that means that line height is always going to scale with the font size so we could do that but as we style and of course we'll pick a color like pink so when we style something like that, because we've applied this class, we can copy and paste, we can change some content. Hello, Nelson. And when we do that, even though the content's different, because this class is applied, because we've applied example class one, aptly named, when we make a change on any one of them, just like we saw on apple.com, it affects both. In fact, if we want to do, I'll just go a little advanced right here. If we want to do something like, like they did on apple.com, we could, of course, create a gradient. Now, it's not going to look great right away. That's okay. We're going to fix this. But we'll create a gradient. We're going to add a background. Instead of using a background image, we'll switch to gradient. Uh, let's do, let's see, let's go start with kind of a red color here. Again, this is going to look ridiculous at first, but that's okay. We're, we'll make it look better. Um, and then we'll end with kind of an amber color right here. Maybe in between, we'll add a stop. It gets us something even more. Oh, this is a hideous. No, that's actually okay. That's a that's a good gradient. Let's affect that gradient angle. And right now, not looking very good. So what do we do? We could say we want to clip that background. So we'll just change clipping and we'll clip it to the text. So not immediately apparent. And that's because the gradient is going across from all the way from left to right. So an example here would be like, hello, Frank, how are you doing today? Good, I hope. You can see that across the full, the full width of this, we are, of course, seeing that gradient. So we could do something like that. Uh, so we talked through that. We also talked through how you can add things like hover effects. So is this the best design site in the history of time? No. Can we make it look a little more like Apple if we were feeling that? Sure. Let's change, of course, our font to System UI. So it's San Francisco. Getting a little bit of an Apple vibe here. Things are getting a little chopped off. So let's increase that height. That's looking good. Apple would align stuff to center. Let's maybe set a max width on some of these things of, let's say, 700 pixels. Getting a little more Apple-y today. Uh, and the last thing we covered was the fact that structurally, we can create things like sections. So we talked a moment ago when we were recapping about layout tools. If we create a section, we can then nest things inside that section. So the hello, Frank, how are you? We can put that in there. Can use the navigator to see our hierarchy and put that in there. And of course, we can use our section. This is such a key to CSS. And this isn't specific to Webflow. This is how CSS works on the web. We can do this. We can select a parent element, like a section. We can select a section. And we can turn on a tool like Flexbox. And when we do, like we talked about in the last section, we can arrange using the direction. So if we want these two elements, example class one, if we want them to stack vertically, we just switch to vertical. If we want to align center, we just align center. If we say that the line height was a bit ridiculous, we can remove that. We can adjust this and get it exactly how we want. So that's what we covered in the previous session. Uh, let's go ahead and add a paragraph because right now it's looking a little plain with just a heading. And we'll set a maximum width on that paragraph of let's say 700 pixels. We'll make this more consistent later by using containers. But for right now, we have a site design that would be rated Greamer. What would you say out of five today? This is like four or five. This is beautiful. Honestly, there yeah. there is a, there's a concept that Kim Scott talks about in uh, the book Radical Candor, and the concept is ruinous empathy. I feel like you just uh, went deep into that territory by calling this four out of five. Nelson, 
bring us bring us back down. Design rating one to one to five. I'm gonna give it a, a two, knowing yeah. that there's still more ahead. So there's room for improvement, and I'm like very excited to see where this goes. Honest and optimistic, Nelson, you're crushing it today. Greamer, glad you're here. Hi. Let's go. Let's go a little deeper into what we can do in Webloam. So what I want to do with this example is cover something that's a difference between two types of animations. So we're going to cover the types of animations that we talked about in the previous session. So those are hover animations, a transition between two states like none, which is kind of what we see right now, and something like hover. Then we're going to go into interactions and see what the difference is there. It's a very, 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 very profound difference. Uh, before we do, any questions, Greamer and uh, Nelson, anything we want to pull from the chat that we want to address before we dig into those two? Uh, nothing that I can see. I nothing. Saw been answering questions already. Great. Great. Nothing that I'm noticing. I'm still thinking about that. I, I stick to it. It's four or five right now. Reamer, uh, honestly, appreciate your honesty. Uh, your gauge is, is needing some adjustment. That's OK. We're all learning. We're all getting better. Uh, and I appreciate that optimism. But I'm with Nelson. It's two out of five right now. You are five out of five right now, though. Doing great this morning. Uh, let's, let's dig deep. All right, here we go. Let's do hover versus interactions. Let's add a button. So we're going to drag a button right in. Again, you can drag something on the canvas, or you can put it in the navigator right here. Let's just use the navigator. And we have a button. Does it look like it matches? No. What should the text say, Nelson? What's our button link? What's our call to action? Click. We're going to keep it as short as possible this time. Oh. <laughs> no. All right. We're going to do that very well. Very good. So with our button selected, again, when we start styling something in Webflow, it's going to automatically create a class, right? So if we start adding some padding, so padding, of course, again, is the space inside an element, uh, doing it, doing this on both sides by holding down Option or Alt and just dragging. We'll add some more padding on the sides. So we'll do 15 and 30. Let's get it just right. Of course, we can always just click. We can set a value. We can type in 30. We can click and set a value, type in 30, and make it as precise as we want. Let's round that radius. That's looking pretty good. Let's do something with the color. In fact, maybe instead of a solid background color, let's go to image. Let's do a gradient here as well. We'll do some of the same stops, but maybe add a little more life to it. So we'll start with that beautiful kind of uh, pinkish red color. And let's go over. Let's add a second stop. Let's just do a warm amber color, maybe a little less saturated. That one looks OK. And we'll just put it to the right here. Is the contrast as high as it should be? No. Is it OK? It's fine for right now for this demo. Switch to bold. And let's increase our font size. Let's make it a little bit larger. All right, Greamer, how are you feeling? So if, if it was a 5 before Greamer, what is it now? Sorry, do you say 4? Was it? I can't remember the rating. Was just yeah, I said it was 4 or a 5. Four. What is it Honestly, now? this is this is going up. This is like 4.1 out of 5. Oh. This is. This is good. Good Nine stuff. more changes and we'll hit a five. This is, this is great. So we have this button. What we covered last time, and we'll apply it to something a little more advanced like this. What we covered last time is that on Hover, we could change our styles. So if we want to uh, adjust that linear gradient, we could. We could also do something, I think, before we did a transform where we can go down. This is under effects, and we are on Hover. Again, when you're normally editing something, you're editing it right here in None. But we went, we went to Hover here. And we can add something, we just hit the little plus. And when we do, we can do something like a transform. What we did last time is we did a rotation. So that's that's OK. That's, that's, a, that's a nice thing. And when we hover over, we could see we have that effect. We also covered how from the none state, we're not in hover, from the none state, we can say, hey, we want to add transitions to animate between those two states. We added a transition. We didn't do anything to opacity. So we went to transform because we want to animate that transform, that rotation from point A to point B. And we increased the duration. It was a little wild last time. And I think, what was it, 17,000 milliseconds? This is a little more realistic. You can even see that boundary, that box is changing shape. Uh, and we can go to preview and see that happen. So very, very, very powerful and honestly uh, beautiful. Uh, what we can do with transitions and our basic kind of state switching to hover. Nelson. There's there's one question from the uh, questions panel. Um, super simple one. Uh, how do you keep the navigator open by default? Oh, this is great. Great question. So there's a lot of different, uh, I would say, preferences for how people work with the navigator. Uh, my preference, personally, is to have the navigator docked. So you can go up here. And when you, uh, by default, especially if you're not on a large display, 
the navigator shows up like this. So you can click and drag something into the navigator. This will pop open and you can see the navigator. But right up here, we can dock it. We can pin it to the navigator. So I'll click pin and that works. And of course, you can grab at the edge and say, the grab at the edge of the navigator, excuse me, and say, hey, we want to keep it, you know, very, very narrow like this or go nice and wide, especially if you have a deep hierarchy um, and you want to be able to see everything at once. Great question. All right, keep those questions coming. We're going to continue to make progress here. So as we hover, we talked about you know, that difference between animated transitions and interactions. Let's see what we can do with that. For this example, let's remove that transition. Again, we can remove a CSS property. We just click on the blue label. Again, the blue label says, hey, a property has been applied. This property has been applied on this class. So we'll click the blue label. We'll hit reset. We're going to remove that. So now we just remove the transition. One more step. We'll go into hover, and we're going to remove that ridiculous transform. We'll do that. So now when we hover, nothing's happening. So what is an interaction? So let's go over to our interactions tab right here. When we do, we see we have two types of triggers. Trigger number one or trigger type one is element triggers. Trigger type two is page triggers. And rather than me doing a voiceover and saying, well, there's these kinds, of, let's just hit the add button right here. We'll just click next to element trigger. We're going to add it. And an element trigger is activated based on interacting with the selected element. So maybe we want something to happen when someone clicks on the element. The element, of course, is the button. Or when someone hovers over. Or when someone moves their mouse over the element. Scrolls into view. So when that element, maybe it's a long page and, we, and the button's not in view. We want something to happen when the button scrolls into view. Or while scrolling in view. So what's the difference between these things? Well, let's do mouse move over element. We're going to go advanced first. We're going, to go, we're going to go advanced first, and we'll, we'll kind of peel it back and uh, go through the fundamentals later. Let's start with advanced first. Mouse move over element. We say on mouse move, we want to perform an action. What kind of action do we want to perform? Well, let's see what we can do. Well, we can play a mouse animation. That would make sense, right? We have a mouse trigger. We're going to play a mouse animation. So we'll just click that. And we have no animations yet because we haven't built anything. So let's just, just like in Keynote, if you're familiar with After Effects, if you've used keyframe-based or action-based timelines before, this will be really, really, really similar. So we're just going to add a new mouse animation. We'll call it what, Greamer? What do you want to call this animation? I would say on... Uh, All right. I think we did great there. Good. So what is this? We have two essentially timelines here. We see mouse X interactions. We all know this from math. X is our left and right, right? So if we're looking at our X axis, we're talking about moving from left to right. And of course, Y is up and down. So let's keep this pretty simple. Let's say when our mouse is to the left, we want to do, it's going to be a wild uh, interaction. Let's say when the mouse is left, we want to move it to the left. And so we're just moving it. We're using this property to move it 56 pixels to the left. And when the mouse is to the right, we want to move it to the right. Let's turn on live preview and see how that works. And we can see we've created a live animation. So as we move to the left, it moves to the left. As we move to the right, it moves to the right. What about mouse Y actions? Well, we can do that too. Let's add a move at Y actions. So when the mouse is at Y, when Y is at 0%, when it's up, Let's move it up. So we're just going to click and drag and move up. And we could say at 100%, let's move it down. Let's see what this looks like. So now, oh, this is going to get glitchy. So as we move up and down, it moves up and down. So we move left and right, it moves left and right. Is this practical? No, but it's pretty fun. So we just create something to play. We can, we can, we can just mess around, create and test out something like this. So that's one thing you can do. That's a... Uh, a, a thing that's probably worthy of deleting, mainly because of the title, Greamer, but also because of the animation. So that's one example. Let's close out of there and delete that one and try something else out. We have page triggers. So what is a page trigger? It's something that applies not to the specific element, but to the page. Maybe we want to create something. When this page loads, we want to create an animation, right? And maybe it's not just this button. We want to animate everything. We want to animate everything in. So how do we do that? Let's go and create under interactions, we're going to go under page triggers and hit the add and go to page load. When we do, we could say one of two things. We want this animation we're about to do to start either when the page starts loading, or maybe if it's a heavy site, you want to wait until it's finished loading. Sometimes this is really helpful if you're creating a, a page loader animation you and you want it to you know be active, but then after the page finishes loading, you want to you know, animate it out or remove that. That's what you could do here. We're going to do when page starts loading. We're going to click in there and start an animation. Same thing as before. This time, instead of a mouse animation, we're going to create a timed animation. We'll create it. Nelson, what should we call this one? 
New timed animation. Else in. Well done. Love it. All right. And when this happens, this is not specific now to any element. So maybe the Hello Frank heading, we want to create an action that animates this in. So how do we do that? Well, we're going to create an animation. Let's create an action. And let's do something. Let's do a combination of things. Let's start with opacity, right? Super basic, super simple. Go to opacity. And let's say we want, when this page loads, we want the opacity. This is going to be backwards right now. That's OK. We want the opacity to go to 0%. So let's hit play. So when the page loads, it just fades away. So is this the most accessible content in the history of time? Let's see. Not at all. Is it still there? We know it's still there. We just can't see it because the opacity is 0. Not very practical. So let's do something different. And this is the key to timed animations in Webflow. The key is when, we, when the page loads, we can set any property in the world as the initial state. So 0% actually is a pretty good initial state for when it loads. So we'll just check this box that says set as initial state. So what have we done? We created one little keyframe, one little action that says set the opacity to 0 as the initial state when you load the page. So what do we expect to happen when we go into preview and see what our site looks like on load? Well, it's doing exactly what we told it to do. The initial state is 0%. Let's change that, though. We're going to add one more keyframe or one more action. We don't want to move it here. We're just going to set opacity. And here, instead of the opacity being at 0%, we want it to be at 100%. And this is where we get the real power. We can create that animation over whatever duration we want. Let's say over one second, we want it to fade in. And of course, we can control our keyframes. We can get very advanced with this, maybe uh, in, out, court. And we can preview. We can hit play. Or we can just go up to preview mode here on the top left. Let's hit play. And of course, it fades in. This is just the beginning, though. We can do anything with this. So as an example, uh, we can add maybe on the initial state, we like the position here, but let's, on the initial state, just clicking here to the left, notice how when we do that, this is the initial state with opacity. If we click to the left, we get that little plus icon. If we click that, we can say, let's add a move. Let's say on initial state, we also want it moved down. So we're looking at the boundary. We see it's about 16 pixels down. Let's add one more to the second keyframe. Again, just clicking to the left. So there's two states here, right? Up here is the initial state. This is on page load. We're going to hit that plus, and we're going to move it. We could actually move it you know, way up or something. But we're just going to type in 0. And we need to do that. We need to make sure we add a value for both positions. And when we do, and you know, it's linear right now, let's say over a second, we want it to, let's, do, uh, let's just do ease in, out. Let's hit preview. And what happens? It fades up. Let's see that again. So we're creating a fade. And we can go wild with this. We can do more and more and more. We can add a rotation. So maybe on page load, we want it. This is, this is going to be hideous. But let's just rotate it along Z. And let's create another rotation. Again, we're going to create a second frame because right now it's hideous. Let's hit 0 on Z. And so what do we have? Again, on the first Z, let's look at our rotate. We're just going to click that. Negative 26 degrees. And on load, it's going to be 0. Again, let's change the duration here. And if we wanted to, having to remember a lot of durations and eases, right? You just multi-select, hold down shift and select all three of these at once. And let's do that. Let's say the duration for all is one second. And instead of having to remember all of these, let's just apply ease in out to all of them. And when we hit preview, we can see it rotates in. It's OK. We'll make it better in a moment. Let's save this and see what else we can do. So when the page starts loading, we have this new timed animation, something aptly named by Nelson. Well done. Let's click in again. Take a look, and we can edit. Is it done? That looks pretty good. Looks pretty good. So that is one time, one timed animation. We can we can apply that. We can do that whenever we want. In this case, when we preview, when we load, it animates. Is it good enough? No. Let's go 3D. So there's something here that we're going to go really advanced. Uh, it's actually not that advanced, but it's really powerful. And that is, of course, Children perspective. So right now in CSS, and this is not unique to Webflow, but it just happens to be a really good thing to do in Webflow because it's visual. Right now, you saw us rotate something, not beautifully, but you saw us rotate something on load. Eh, it's OK. Actually, it's going to bother me if we keep it. We need to go back in here, and we're going to remove that rotation. Just holding down Command this time, selecting both the rotations, removing it, because it was ruining the simplicity of this animation. Let's go back. OK, that's much better. But something to note is every time we've done a rotate, notice how we've rotated it this way. Again, let's take a look at that. Let's add, we're not in interactions, just selecting the button. Let's add a 3D or a 2D transform again. 
we'll see every time we've demoed this, we just do this, right? Then if you do this, it kind of skews a little bit. We're getting some interesting things going on. What's really happening there? We don't really know right away. It's, it's, it's something. Let's take a look at this, though. Let's take a look at what happens in 3D. So I want to remove the one we just created and show this. When we have an element like this and we're rotating it, let's create it just a new transform. We'll go to rotate. When we're rotating about the y-axis, just the y-axis, not adding eight different things at once, notice how it just kind of squishes. That's not how something happens in real life, right? And if we hold, let's see, this notebook right here. If we hold this notebook in real life, especially because of the distance between the camera, the webcam, and, uh, and this, the notebook, as we rotate, it doesn't look flat, right? There's perspective. So that's what children perspective is all about. We're going to add children perspective. So let's keep this. Let's just keep rotating this. We'll take a look at that. What happens if we add perspective? So there's a few ways to do this. What I want to do, though, is turn this section into a camera. And the way you turn a section into a camera in the web, in Webflow as well, is we're going to select the section. We're going to take the section, and we're going to add a property to it. So remember over 2D and 3D transforms, we've been hitting this plus. What do these three dots do? Let's click the three dots. And we're going to add children perspective. Now, there's lots of different things you can put here. For our example, let's just type in 1,000. And suddenly, we have this immediate actual 3D look to this button. What's going on there? Why is it rotated like that? Why is it kind of off kilter? Uh, and the reason is it's turned the whole section into a camera. What does that mean? Let's add a little bit of height to this. Let's say 500 pixels, and let's increase that height. I'm just going to click Alt and drag Option or Alt. Notice how it's actually moving that. Why is the height affecting that? And the reason is, the just like a real lens, just like a, a real lens, as you get towards the center, things start to even out. And as you go towards the edge of a lens, you know it kind of warps or distorts. That's normal perspective for a camera. So what we've done is we've turned the camera into a 3D object, or we've turned it into a 3D camera by setting that children perspective. So now anything we rotate in 3D space, so we'll add a transform on this. We start rotating this in 3D space. Notice how the paragraph is 3D. Interesting. Let's remove those properties. Just clicking, holding down Option or Alt, and removing that transform, because we can do more. We mentioned we'd get into div blocks. And I mentioned earlier that a div block is just something, a div on the web is something that can also wrap other things. So what does that mean? Let's drag a div block and let's put these different elements inside. So we'll put the heading inside, put the paragraph inside, just dragging each of these things inside that div inside. So now we have a div block inside a section. What if we click the div block and just rotate the div block? Let's add a transform, rotate and rotate. Notice how we have a 3D effect that's applying to everything. It's getting clipped off, so we might want to make our section a little taller. Right now it's 500. We can make it a lot taller. Now notice it's still getting clipped off. That's because we told our section to align to the center, but we didn't yet say to justify. Let's justify to the center. We've created a 3D element. The most wild thing about 3D on the web, especially when you're using transforms like this, you go into preview, Check this out. <laughs> this is the coolest thing. Sorry, let's just do that again. It's, it's animating already everything in 3D. But check this out. You are highlighting. You are interacting with the web in 3D. Notice how the highlight, literally, the, the, the browser highlight is in 3D. This is the coolest thing in the history of time. We're getting close to 5 out of 5. Not, like, I, is, I mean, it's, it's getting nah, close. Okay. We're getting yeah. close. We're getting Remember, close. Appreciate your energy. It's, it's wonderful. Nelson, what would you rate this out of 5 so far? I'm rating it a 3.5. You're getting there. Um, uh, if you like John Williams so much, I'm waiting for you to slant it back so we get the Star Wars effect. Oh, oh, come on, Nelson. That was it. Come on. That was probably the best idea. That's brilliant. Uh, you do that, it'll be five out of five. Does anyone know the angle? Nelson, you want to look it up, the angle? Uh, we'd have to calculate the actual basically get to something like Just this. It. There you go. Oh, this is this is it. So if we wanted to, I mean, let's 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 do this. Um a new hope and crawl. I mean we're not gonna do the full thing, but I think we can do uh will this will this be the opening crawl for New Hope? Where's the opening crawl? Here we go. This is it. A sinister new battle station it doesn't say the Death Star. Doesn't the official one actually say Death Star? And it's all caps? Not sure, but as you do this, I'll sing the background music for it. Okay, ready? Okay, okay. Wait, 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 Nelson. I'm, I'm, I got gotcha. you. Oh, this is so cool. Come on. Select the div block. Da, 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 da. This is so offensive, Nelson. You know what you're doing. You are using 
<laughs> I can't. He's using a uh, um, the Jurassic Park score for uh, uh, for this. But we could, if we like, uh, if we like what we're doing here, we rotated that div. We could say, hey, this example class one. Let's start naming these things better. Opening crawl text. We could do that. And if we want to transform that, notice how moving it up and down is literally creating a Star Wars effect, right? So if we want to do that, we can roll all the way back here, just holding down Option or Alt, and we're literally creating Star Wars in Webflow. Now, is this the right typography? No. Is this the actual text? No. Did George Lucas actually left a line it? Yes. There are lots of things, of course, we could make better. But the point here that Nelson is illustrating, and Nelson, really, really great idea here. I think this is fantastic. Is that we can use 3D transforms for base. Oh, oh, hello, Nelson. For basically anything. And we can get wild with how we implement it. Let's get wild with how we implement it. So we've done a lot here. Let's actually clear this uh, rotation. So let's just remove. We can hit remove here. We're going kind of back to normal. Sorry, Nelson. It was good, but we're going to switch it back to a bit more of a oh, undo. A bit more of a, a realistic heading. So I'm just going to hit undo a few times and go all the way back to where we were. So again, we have this div block. And we know if we select that section that we have those properties. There's three dots applied. And we can see we've set that children perspective. Oh, one more thing. Just to illustrate, Nelson, that was such a good example. You've thrown me off. I love it. Uh, absolutely love it. Uh, so one more thing. If we have something like that, what did that number do before? The 1,000 pixels? Well, if we go into 3D transforms, we can affect children perspective. And what does it do? It's just like the focal length on a lens on a camera. So the higher that number is, the more it's like a telephoto camera far away from a subject zoomed way in. But if we pull back, this is much more like shooting in a wide angle lens. You ever take a selfie on an iPhone and you notice towards the edge is a little more distortion because that spherical distortion just makes everything stretch towards the edge of that lens. That's what a lower children perspective does. It creates it. It increases that drama of that uh, of that effect. So it's like shooting with a telephoto lens, the higher the number goes. Or, Greamer, are you doing a selfie right now? You're... OK, I'd like everyone to know in this room, you can see what's on. Greamer's looking at his notifications on his lock screen. He's not actually taking a selfie. No, it's checking out what you're saying. It's, it's true. I like by, it. By looking at your notifications? They were in the way. Oh, OK. That's good. Anyway, that's what that controls, though. Children perspective controls the drama or the accentuation of that thing. Let's go wild. Let's, collect, let's click div block. We're going to remove that transform, and we're going to do something else. So now that we've turned on 3D, let's do a different type of page trigger. So we know on page load, we have this effect. It comes up. That's, that's OK. That's great. So we have that page load. What if we want to add another page trigger? So let's add a page trigger. This time, let's say while the mouse is moving in the viewport. The viewport is essentially the canvas, the white canvas that we have. The viewport is what's in a browser in the bounds of uh, the content that loads. So let's do that. Let's say page trigger while the mouse is moving in the viewport. And what do we want to have happen? Well, we want an action on mouse move. We want to select an action. And we're going to play a new mouse animation we're going to build right now. We're going to hit Add. And Greamer, you knew this was coming. What are we going to name this? We're going to add. Who knew that this was coming? I think we'll truncate it right there. Uh, and that's good. This time, we can do a move like we did before. But let's do a rotation. Let's say, again, mouse X is left and right. So at 0%, when the mouse is all the way at the left, let's add a rotation. So we're just going to go to rotate. And we're going to set the Y rotation like this. So we'll set it you know, 20 degrees to the right. And if we're doing it, oh, excuse me, 20 degrees to the left. So if we're doing it 20 degrees, negative 20 degrees that way, that means when we're at 100% on the right side of the screen, let's set it to 20 degrees in the other direction. Let's move it over to 20 degrees in the other direction. And one more thing, let's do it to Y as well. Let's say it's 0%. We'll rotate up. So at 0%, we want everything facing up. So we'll do, let's just say, 20 degrees up. And right here, let's do 20 degrees down. So when we're at the bottom of the display, 20 degrees down. So what happens? Hit Preview. Let's go in. And you can see, as we're moving our mouse, we are getting a rotation that's affecting in real time. We are affecting a live rotation, a mouse animation in real time. And it's still fully interactive. We can highlight this stuff. Notice how the perspective is applying. We can interact. You know, if we want to go in, because we've because we've built this using a div, because we put everything in that div, we can even add a form. Let's go in to Webflow and add a form. So we'll add a form block here. Let's go in. We add a form. Let's keep it the way it is right now. Let's, of course, make sure we're keeping things consistent, though. Let me save that interaction. Let's keep things consistent. Let's make sure our submit button 
is using that same button class we had before. So we have that button class. Let's add button to that so we can see we're keeping things consistent. So let's go into preview. And the form is in 3D as well. Go into name. We can say, hello, Greamer, or Frank, or whatever your name is. You're wonderful. Greamer at webflow.com. Uh, if anyone is enjoying this session, I strongly recommend reaching out to Greamer at webflow.com. That is his official email address. He very much enjoys fan mail. Um, if you have something nice to say, if you have words of wisdom, if you have just Honestly, and even if you're watching this recording uh, days, weeks, months down the road, reach out to Greamer at Greamer at Webflow.com and just tell him how good of a job he's doing. Um, if you haven't seen his work on Webflow University, he does some incredible teaching uh, for how to use Webflow, how to use CSS, including some of these animations. If you go to Webflow University, of course, it's free. You can see here's Greamer right here. Look at that photo. Greamer, looking at myself. Wow, Honestly, how narcissist can I be? Uh, Jesus. <laughs> A little bit, but that's okay. Like this is this the same sweater? I only have one sweater. It, it does seem. Oh, there's Miguel holding a calculator, and there's Greamer holding coffee. I can't. I love this one. Look at look at your face. Anyway, if you think Greamer's doing a great job, reach out to Greamer. Greamer at webflow.com. But the point is, notice how we're still interacting with this stuff in 3D space. Super powerful. So that's great. So we're talking about a little bit of things we can do in 3D. And the reason it's helpful to go like that, I mean, are we covering the fundamentals of CSS grid as part of this right now? No, we'll touch that in a second. But the reason sometimes this is powerful is it lets us creatively flex this different muscle that sometimes when we're hand coding something, we're not thinking through, you know, we're thinking, oh, that's going to be really taxing because I'm going to have to load up an external JavaScript library and have to figure out how to tie the trigger of mouse position to a specific thing. The reason using a tool like Webflow is helpful for this is it lets us very quickly iterate on interaction design. It lets us very quickly iterate on, you know, what would a mouse move, a hover, uh, you know, different types of triggers. What can we actually toy with? And the stakes are super low. You saw what happened when Nelson just randomly and beautifully brought up Star Wars as part of this. Like, we could just try it out if we like it. It works. And if we don't, we don't have to use it. That's the beauty of being able to quickly iterate with Webflow, with other tools. If you use Figma, Figma is another great iteration tool. We use a lot of tools like that um, in design. You'll see, you can see on my on my screen, some of the creative tools that we love using. This is some of the stuff I love. I love ScreenFlow, Figma, Pro Tools is good. Uh, Cinema 4D is one of our favorites in design. Like it goes, you can run the gamut. I'm sure there's stuff on here that's uh, that's not even on the stock that's just really fun to use. We all do that. We all use these tools to quickly iterate, to hopefully expressively design in a way that the stakes are low enough that we're not going to break anything. We're not going to always revert. We can always bring something back. We can really toy around and, and feel that creative freedom of let's just try it. Let's just try something. Let's try building something. And that's a beautiful thing. So uh, we're going to go a little bit into uh, an example for uh, something else. But before we do that, I'd love to open it up for additional questions. Nelson, Greamer, what do we got? Uh, there's one that keeps coming up. Uh, difference between section, div block, and container. Great. That's a fantastic question. The answer is, at the fundamental basic property of each of those things, they are divs. Divs are just rectangles that can contain other stuff, and they do whatever you want. The reason they're listed in Webflow, and the reason a lot of developers will develop different versions of a div for something like that, is because they serve different purposes. So again, they're just boxes that you put stuff inside. So that's a great question. Let's actually build that. Let's go in. And generally, the hierarchy would be, you have a section. We'll just drag that to the top. This is our new section. We've just got some space up here. Let's say in that section, um, let's let's just start. We're, we're going to use stuff we already have. So let's bring, bring Hello Nelson into that section. So we have that up top. Again, everything is left aligned. That's how we told it uh, because we haven't applied anything to that section yet. That's okay. So we have Hello Nelson. Let's add some uh, new paragraph up here. So we're just building a, a, a section. And notice what what's starting to happen. We'll add one more thing. Let's add this button. So we're just creating a section. In fact. This section right now, our first one, I'm going to set its display to hidden, so we're not even looking at it right now. So we just basic page. We have the stuff is still here, but you can see over here it's set to hidden. That's OK. Collapse that so we don't have to think about it for a moment. We have this section with three things inside. Hello, Nelson. We're going to keep it as short as possible this time. And the lorem ipsum filler text. So what's going on? Well, we know we can set something on a section like Flexbox. We know we could use that to vertically stack and align and justify content. But look at this. What's happened every time we've selected something? We set this little maximum width. That's not always the best way because if we have to set maximum width on like 50 different things and we want to change it, now we've got to change it on 50 different things. So 
That's when a container comes in. We can add a container, which will constrict the width horizontally. So if we bring in a container, let's say, put it in the section. So this the container's in the section. And then we move that stuff into the container now. So just put the H1, the button, and the paragraph in the container. Notice how it's all constricting the width to the boundary of the container. So that's what a container does. A, a container can go in a section and constrict the width so that you're not having to do this reading all the way from the left to the right, and that's okay. A div is one layer deeper than that. A div, we can go in, we can add a div and say, hey, we love our container, we're using it, but we actually want to use our div to group some other stuff together. So I'll give an example here. Uh, let's put this paragraph in the div. And right now we're not doing a great name, a great uh, uh, job of naming things. Let's name this div. Um, little div wrapper. We can say, hey, we don't want the paragraph to really be uh, hyper-styled. In fact, let's create a few paragraphs, a few paragraphs here. We can create that div wrapper and say, you know what? We actually do want to constrict the width further than the farther than the uh, container. So let's set the max width to 400 pixels. And so that's what happens. Uh, by default, notice how it's only using the space inside. The container is not taking up full width here. That's why it's kind of linking there. But if we want the container to take up the full width, we can do that. But notice how the content inside is actually informing what's happening here. So in the box model, we learned that things by default are sized by the content inside. So the container is only going to keep it constricted if it needs that space, but it's not using that space. Because we set on the section, we set center, align center, it's only going to use the space that's needed here. So if we align it to the left, why is it not aligned? Oh, because we're not we're not affecting the container that way. What happens here if we want to have things take a little bit of a wider um, uh, a wider thing, a wider space, we can always set aside we can always set size or increase the width of the content. So as we keep typing, it'll continue until it hits at maximum width of the container. Now, what I really recommend, if you want to go deep into this, we actually have on Webflow University a great video that explains it's a great design. Mackenzie just uh, worked on this design. Love, you can see this example of, um, I love that sheen. You can see this example of that rotational parallax. Uh, we have a lesson on that too. But on Webflow University, take a look at, what's that, uh, Grimer, what's that? Uh, the one we have is like sections versus divs versus, um, Section one is really good to see, but check out the container and section on Webflow University. Um, really good lessons that'll show you how to use each of these things in the right way. And we'll walk you through the common ways to build the most common layouts using real world examples to do each. Uh, and we'll walk you through how to do each of those. For right now, let's delete this section. Let's turn our original section back on. Switch back to flex there. So looking good. All right. All right, what other questions do we have? Greemer and Nelson. While you do that, I'm just going to undo to go back to where we were. It's going through the undo stack. This original so I guess design. you've Great. shown a lot of stuff with um, elements, uh, text, sure. and whatnot. Uh, here's a good question uh, about images. Can you add images to Webflow, and uh, can you apply animations to it? Absolutely. So this is a great question. So let's do, let's do that right now. Uh, Nelson, can you smile? <laughs> they took a screenshot of Nelson. Let's drag that right into Webflow. <laughs> now we have Nelson. So that's our. It looks image. more like he's scared than smiling, but that's that's fine. Uh, that's Grieber, my can, regular smile. Oh. Can, can you do a smile as well? All right, <laughs> guys. What happened to the uh, the design quality? Now where are we at a five? I think we might be going up because I really like where we're going. This is four four point three. Oh wow, this is exceptional. So yes, you can add images to Webflow. Uh, you could, by the way, the assets panel is so so powerful. The assets panel lets you add yes images. You can you can add. I mean, there's there's uh, you, could, you could add tons of stuff. You got like PDFs. You could, you could add tons of stuff to the assets panel. You can also add Lottie animations. If you have used, if you've used After Effects, you can literally import an After Effects animation into Webflow. You could actually import After Effects into Webflow and have a full-blown After Effects animation that's controlled by interactions. It's really, really, really powerful. So I'm going to answer this question about images, but I just got to show you guys uh, Lottie. Um, it's super cool. So a Lottie animation in Webflow basically is uh, 
showing you it basically in After Effects, you can export using an extension called Body Moving. You can actually export it from After Effects and pop Body it move right in. It's close. I'm pretty sure it's pronounced better. Uh, it's it's exceptional. So check this out if you use or want to use After Effects. We walk you through everything there. Um, but yes, you can import images. This is this is this is quite something, guys. Uh, you can import images. You can manipulate images, and uh, of course. Notice how the images react just like you'd expect as part of everything else. Can you add effects on images? Sure. Let's even say, this is pretty cool. So let's say within the context of 3D space, you want to do a rotation of Greamer. You can do that too. We're just rotating Greamer in 3D space. And notice how he's moving within 3D. Beautiful layering of 3D, literally using just native web tools and Webflow. Notice how that intersection, look what's happening on the word hello there. You're seeing that intersection happening. So obviously the things that you can do with that are limitless. Uh, can you animate images in? Can you do your own thing? Of course. And that's really the key with not just Webflow. This is more of a web note, which is as you build out your hierarchy, as you think through how you want to develop your sites, how you want to develop uh, your pages, you can nest things inside of each other. And you'll, you can apply things to parent elements that will affect their child elements. So we didn't have to create an interaction on each and every one of these elements. We created an interaction that applied to that div block. And we just happened to put a lot of stuff in that div block. That's all we did. So that's using images in some contexts in Webflow. Can you go beyond this? Of course. Is this terrifying? Mildly. But that's the idea of using images in Webflow. Yes, you can put images in Webflow. And you know, based on optimization, notice how these are probably, I just did PNGs, just quick captures. They might be a little bit larger, 147K for, it's a little, it's a little heavy. You can always in Webflow um, convert those images to WebP as well for optimization. But yes, we can use images in Webflow. What other questions do we have? Any tough questions? Any curveballs? We had one uh, question on why it is called children perspective. That's great. So because you apply it to a parent container and the relationship between these elements, when we talk about parents and children in the context of the web, we're saying the section here is a parent element of this div block. And that's because the div block is nested inside of that. It's a child to the parent. So when we're setting the perspective and we want it to affect the children, when we go into, you know, we added, what was it? 1,000 uh, 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 1,000 pixels of uh, children perspective. We went in here and we added 1,000 pixels of children perspective. It's called children perspective because it's affecting the perspective of the children inside. Where it's affecting the perspective of the children elements, the child elements of that section. The distance is simulating the distance you'd have if it was something like a camera lens. Great question. What else we got? Looking good, Nelson. Honestly, great look. Good headphones. Thank you. But they really um, truncated your name by like one letter and junior, just to fit it uh, here. And then Greamer, yours is at Greamer Green. Greamer Green, yeah, I like that. Yeah. All right, so we got that. One uh, more thing. How I've... can? Oh, okay, go ahead. No, go, Nelson. It's good. Uh, how can you use the same interaction on a different div? How can you? Use... Can you say that again? How can you use the same interaction on a different div? And I think Ooh. it's just uh, reusing interactions mm -hmm. on multiple elements. Totally. So this 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 site, sorry to delete you guys, but uh, this site is getting away from us because it's so complicated. So I'm gonna I'm gonna simplify it just to uh, to talk about that. If you have another thing in your site, so let's just actually I'll bring it back. If you have Nelson uh, and he's right here in the section. And notice how he's not in that div. So you have the div and the image. And it's only affecting the top, right? That interaction is only affecting the top. If you wanted Nelson to also have an interaction applied, with Nelson selected, you can go over to Interactions. And you can say, Mouse Move and Viewport. This is fine. We have this mouse animation. You can do that. But if you're building an animation in Webflow, perhaps a better example of this would be the page load animation that we have, this timed animation here. Um, when you apply an animation to one thing, so you create the animation, uh, to one, th uh, one thing, you can add it on other things as well. Maybe a better example here, uh, a quick example would be on page load, you can add a timed animation. Um, so it's a, good, it's a good question because without actually building an animation that would apply to multiple things, I'm trying to think of, it, of a quick example of how to do that uh, without having to build something in four minutes. 
Um, it's a good question. I would recommend, we actually cover that specific question, reusing interactions in the interactions and animations course. Um, that's a four minute lesson and it'll do it much more efficiently than I can do in three minutes. Uh, so I would check that out on Webflow University. Uh, we have that an interactions and animations course. It's completely free and it'll walk you through exactly how to do that. Uh, all right. So one last thing I do want to show, we're going to use Nelson's image for this. One last thing I do want to show is CSS grid. So CSS grid. Let's create a new section. We'll put it down below. Uh, and let's add Nelson. OK, but let's not just add one Nelson. Let's add several. So we're just going to paste Nelson a bunch of times. By default, because we're using you know, HTML and CSS. These these things are just going to wrap normally. This is Nelson that's just wrapping normally. But if we select our section, we talked about you know parents and children, the relationship between the parent elements and children elements. If we select the parent element of Nelson, we can turn on grid. So we can go to display with the, with the section selected and turn on grid. Now, what does that do instantly? It's not very impressive because it's only two columns. But we can specify the number of columns or the number of rows and start using grid-based design. And it's entirely visual. So you're able to affect different properties like this. We can affect the spacing of these things. We can even span. So I'm going to hit done here. We can grab Nelson and actually span Nelson across multiple divs. We can say, hey, for our image, you know, uh, we, we like that, um, but maybe we want you know, another image for one of them. Let's replace uh, this image. Let's replace that with Greamer. So we can do that. So we can do grid-based design in Webflow as well. The reason this is helpful is because you're able to set grid-based designs on the actual canvas. Let me select the section. You can actually set grid-based designs on the canvas and manipulate using these FRs, these fraction units. The reason that's impressive is because unlike setting explicit pixels, which are which will be expressed differently and will be clipped off on different browsers or different different widths depending on the space available. An FR is like a fraction. So if something's set to two FR, that means it's going to be that column's going to be two times as wide as one FR. It does the math for you, and you never have to think about you know division and, and thinking about the distribution of those things. You just size it how you want to size. Not only that. But with CSS Grid, we can affect gap. So gap lets us say, hey, let's decrease the gap between the columns or between the rows. Right now, it's locked. So we can do something a little bit different if we want the gap to maybe be wider, but the rows to not exist right there. So uh, super basic example. Again, strong recommendation. Check out Grid on Webflow University. Uh, we have wonderful documentation on the topic, as well as how to build CSS grid uh, layouts in Webflow. Great video that covers how to use all of this. But that is an overview of interactions and some basic layout uh, in Webflow. Again, much of this is just the beginning. But the goal with what we showed today is, again, to show that you can very quickly iterate on visual things that might otherwise be complex when you when you do them manually with code. And so what we did today was obviously we recapped everything for uh, from the box model HTML and CSS, but we built a layout that is actually a functional layout with a heading, a paragraph, a form in 3D space that rotates that has a kind of Apple like gradient to it and a submit button that works. And we created a grid that is mildly to severely terrifying. That is our overview today. And I just want to say uh, to Nelson, thank you so much for being here. To Greamer, to Utkarsh for helping us organize this. Uh, to Emily, thank you so much. But, but most importantly, to everyone who's watching this live, uh, to everyone who's watching this video, please email Greamer at greamer at webflow.com to let him know how good of a job he's doing at Webflow and in life. Uh, with that, I'll pass it back over to wrap up for today. Thank you, everyone, so much. Greamer, any last words? Utkarsh, any last words? No, I'm just uh, happy to be a part of this. And thank you for um, putting my email out there. I appreciate it. And Greamer, G-R-I-M-U-R at webflow.com. Absolutely. And thank you, Utkarsh. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot, everyone, for being a part of it. And we will see we will see you next time on Monday, same time at 8 a.m. Pacific time. And thanks a lot for being a part of it. In case if you missed out a part of the session, you can always go and refer out to the YouTube link that we had mentioned in the chat. And for similar bite-sized content, you can also refer to Webflow University, as McGuire, Grimmer, and Nelson kept on mentioning in the between. If there are any tits and bits of pieces that you have left out, so you can always Please check out those as well. See you on Monday. And uh, yeah, you can also network around with fellow learners in the launch.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.